We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories. And Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to the award-winning Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. We are bringing old-school basketball to a new-school audience, and today we bring you a story of humility. This is a story of a life lesson learned. If any of us ever get to a point in our life where we think we know it all, we probably do not. This is a story about always being open to learning something new. This is the story of John Wooden's Lost Penny. It was all part of an annual pep talk that he used to give right before the first game of each season while he was at UCLA. You might call it a ritual, you might call it corny, you might even call it unnecessary, but it is hard to argue with the man that many consider the greatest basketball coach of all time. At the very least, he is considered the greatest college basketball coach of all time. John Wooden won 10 national championships while he was at UCLA. That is why they call him the Wizard of Westwood, the section of Los Angeles where UCLA is located. When it comes to men's basketball, the next closest is Mike Krzyzewski from Duke University with five national championships, only half as many. I know that when it comes to women's college basketball, Gino Oriyama from the University of Connecticut has 11 national championships, and the late great Pat Summit from the University of Tennessee has eight. All four of these coaches are absolutely phenomenal. Now, of those 10 championships that John Wooden won, seven of them were in a row, and all 10 of them came within a 12-year run of absolute domination. But he was not just an incredible coach, he was also an incredible player in his own right. For a very long time, he was the only person to be inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame twice. Once as a player, and then again as a coach. In that category, he was eventually joined by Lenny Wilkins, Tom Heinsohn, Bill Sharman, and Bill Russell. And Wooden was not just considered a great coach, he was considered an incredible teacher. His lessons went far beyond the basketball court. He saw his mission as developing men for the future. For him, basketball was simply the means for developing future leaders. He had some of the greatest players in basketball play for him. This is just a short list of the top players that played for Wooden at UCLA. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, then known as Lou Cinder, Bill Walton, Gail Goodrich, Walt Hazard, Jamal Wilkes, Sidney Wicks, and Marquez Johnson. It was an incredible run of talent that he had come through his program. Now, here is the ritual that I was talking about at the beginning of the episode. As his team prepared to play their first game of each season, he would come into the locker room to give the players a pep talk to get the season started. It was basically the same pep talk every single year, and Wooden was all about preparation. He felt that practice was for preparation and getting ready to play the game. If the players were not ready by the time the ball went up in the air for the tip-off, then there was really not much he could do at that point. That was the theme of his annual season opening pep talk. According to Bill Walton, he would say, quote, Men, I've done my job. The rest is up to you. When that game starts out there, please don't ever look over at me at the sideline. There is nothing more that I can do to help you from that point forward. Now let's get it going, up and down, unquote. He would continue talking about getting the season started on the right foot and establishing good habits. As he continued to talk, he would start looking around like he was distracted. Then suddenly, he would break off mid-sentence and walk over near the wall and discover a lost penny. He would pick up the penny and hold it up for all the players to see with a big smile on his face. He would say, quote, look at this guys, somebody has dropped and lost a penny. This is a good omen for us. This now found penny represents good luck, and it means that we have a chance at success." Unquote. 
He would then slip the penny into the empty slot in his penny loafer. There, the penny would stay for the entire season. The new players each season would look at Coach Wooden in awe. I mean, they thought it was silly. They had been preparing tirelessly for the season, and now the success of the season would depend on finding a lucky penny? But if that made the coach happy, then who was to say anything about it? Of course, what none of the new players ever noticed was that one of John Wooden's shoes had an empty slot just waiting for that penny. The returning players mostly rolled their eyes as they had seen this already. Every year, Coach Wooden would find a lucky penny at the exact moment of the pep talk. Of course, they had already figured out that the penny was not lost at all. It was planted. But if you have ever played a sport of any kind at any level, then you know that some people have certain rituals or habits that they develop that must be done before they can take the field or court. Mark Jackson of the NBA used to tie his wedding ring into the laces of his shoes so that he would always have his wedding ring with him. Michael Jordan was famous for wearing a brand new pair of shoes every game that he played, and he would lace those shoes himself. I mean, he could have had a ball boy or an equipment manager do that, but that was part of his ritual is to lace up his own shoes every game. Bill Russell used to vomit before every game because of his intense nervousness. His coach, Red Arbach, would not let the Celtics take the court until Russell finished his uh, routine. For John Wooden, it was finding a lucky penny as part of his pre-game prep talk before the first game each season. Now, no one really knew how long he had been doing it, but at the time that Bill Walton was getting ready to play his first game for UCLA, they had already won the five previous national championships in a row. So how could you argue with that? Remember that back then, freshmen or first-year players were not allowed to play on the varsity team. They had to wait until their sophomore year or second year in order to join the regular team. So, as a sophomore, Walton watched his coach discover the penny with complete wonder. If coach thought that finding that penny was good luck, then that was fine by him. Now, this is a good place to take a break, and I'll be right back and I will share the story of how the penny once got lost. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. At the Sports History Network, we're all about sports yesteryear, and so we're so pleased to introduce you to Row One, an online memorabilia gallery and shop that brings your sports history to life anywhere. The Row One Gallery includes over 5,200 gorgeously reproduced prints of team posters, game program covers, game tickets, advertisements, and more in baseball, pro and college football, pro and college basketball, and more. And any gallery item may be printed in a variety of sizes on wood, metal, canvas, acrylic, or poster paper. And in Row One Shop, check out the thousands more of unique items with a retro and historical designs dating back to 1876 including t-shirts long sleeve shirts phone cases mugs blankets pillows towels and even shower curtains go to sportshistorynetwork.com row number one for access to the full row one catalog and for gallery prints and gift items plus get a 15 percent discount off all prints on the row one pictorum gallery with coupon code shn15 follow the link on the show notes Welcome back to the show and let us continue with the story of John Wooden's lost penny. As I mentioned before the break, John Wooden had a ritual before the first game of each season. During the pep talk for the first game, he would discover a lucky penny. I also mentioned Bill Walton briefly. He is the Hall of Fame center who had extremely bad luck with injuries that limited his professional career to only four and a half seasons worth of games over a 14 year career. He missed almost two thirds of his career due to injury, but when he was healthy, he was as good as anyone you've ever seen. He was just short of seven feet tall and could jump like he was on a trampoline. He blocked shots, grabbed nearly every rebound, and could get the outlet pass going for a fast break like few people ever could. By the way, if you want to hear a fuller profile on Bill Walton, go back and check out episode 12. But anyway, here is where Walton enters the story. As I mentioned, he witnessed Coach Wooden's lost penny speech for the first time as a sophomore and he thought it was genuine. He was in awe. UCLA went on to win their sixth consecutive national championship in 1972 and Walton was named College Basketball's National Player of the Year. It is like winning the MVP for college basketball. As a junior, he sat and listened to Coach Wooden's pregame speech before the first game and he witnessed the lost penny ritual again. It dawned on him that the penny was planted and that Coach Wooden did this every single year. But he did not say anything because he did not want to ruin it for the new guys. He let them experience it with fresh eyes as he 
had the year before. And again, UCLA won the national championship, the school's seventh in a row in 1973. And again, Walton was named the National College Player of the Year. He was the first two-time winner of the Naismith Player of the Year award, and he still had a year left to play. Now, let us fast forward to Walton's senior year, or final year. This time, he knew what was going to happen, and he was waiting for the penny to be placed. As the players were in the locker room preparing to play the first game of the season, Walton noticed one of the assistant coaches walk into the locker room and quietly drop the penny near the wall where Wooden would discover it just a few minutes later. The assistant coach then left the locker room to get Coach Wooden to let him know that the penny was in place and the players were ready for the pep talk. But while the coaches were out in the hallway, Walton went over and picked up the penny and hung onto it. Walton found the whole ritual silly and beneath the players of their caliber. They were the seven-time defending national champions. They were a good team and UCLA had more basketball talent on their roster than any school in the country. They did not need a lucky penny to win an eighth consecutive championship. At least that was the way that Walton thought about it. He took his seat just as Wooden walked in for the talk. As usual, Coach Wooden walked in and talked about the preparation and how it was now the player's turn. He had done all that he could and the players needed to do their job. He talked about getting off to a good start to the season, and then the moment came that Coach Wooden began to appear distracted. He looked over to where the penny was supposed to be, but it was not there. Then he began to look around the room for real. Maybe the assistant misplaced the penny. Wooden was now starting to look a little worried. His whole speech built up to the discovery of the penny, but the penny was not there. There was an awkward silence as Wooden had no idea where to go next with the speech. There was no penny. Suddenly, Walton stood up and said, Come on, guys, let's go. We're a great team. We don't need luck. And coach, here's your silly lucky penny. And he handed Wooden the penny and the players took the floor and won the game easily. Walton won his third straight National Player of the Year award, but UCLA failed to win the national championship. They struggled with little things all year. Their offense was not as efficient as it had been in the past. They were on a record 88 game winning streak when they lost by one point to Notre Dame on January 19, 1974. It was the first loss for UCLA in nearly three years. For Walton himself, it was his first loss of his college career. He had been perfect at UCLA up to that point. It was also his first loss since he was a 15 year old high school player. He had not lost a game in nearly five years. It got worse from there. They lost two more regular season games, but still made it to the NCAA tournament. In the tournament, they defeated the University of Dayton and the University of San Francisco to clinch a spot in the Final Four. Now, by coincidence, the Final Four was played in Greensboro, North Carolina, the home of North Carolina State University, and UCLA's opponent in the national semifinal, North Carolina State University. They had beaten North Carolina State earlier in the season on a neutral court in St. Louis, Missouri, but now they are playing for a shot at a championship on the other team's home floor. Even with a couple of 14-point leads, they were not able to hang on and made too many mistakes down the stretch. They lost by three points, and Walton felt awful. If he had not messed with that penny, maybe things would have turned out differently. They definitely had the talent to win it again, but nothing seemed to go right. When they landed back at the airport in Los Angeles, he turned to Coach Wooden and apologized for ruining the whole season. He should have never picked up that penny. I still have a hard time believing the grace that Coach Wooden showed to Bill Walton. He chose not to get into it right there, even though he was upset that Walton messed up the lost penny speech. He simply handed Walton a letter, and it said, quote, To Bill Walton, it's the things that you learn after you know it all that count, unquote. Man, what a lesson. Coach Wooden was always teaching. He used the opportunity to give Walton one of the biggest life lessons he ever learned. Always be open to learning new things and don't ever think that you know it all. Don't ever think that you are better than anyone else. Walton never forgot that lesson. And the other thing that gets me about this moment is that Wooden already had that letter in his pocket. Who knows how long he carried it with him, but he had it ready just waiting for that moment when he could teach Walton one of the biggest life lessons that he ever received. That blows me away. Walton maintained a very close relationship with Coach Wooden until Wooden's death in 2010 at the age of 99. Walton credits Coach Wooden with making him a better man. 
The year after Walton graduated, UCLA went on to win their 10th and final championship for Coach Wooden, who retired right after that last game. And I think there is a lesson to learn here. I mean, besides the one that Walton learned about always keeping an open mind and always being open to learning new things, the lesson is not to mess with other people's habits, no matter how silly they seem on the surface. We all do things that help us prepare for a game or a season or anything else in life. And this one was very important to Coach Wooden. Let people prepare in their own way. Even through this podcast episode, Coach Wooden is still teaching us all. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time when we share the story of Harvey Pollock, the former statistician for the Philadelphia 76ers. When his career ended in 2015, he was the last original NBA employee still working in the NBA. He was a part of the NBA for the first 69 seasons of the league. He literally witnessed all of the greats from George Mikan to Giannis Atentacumpo and everyone in between. That's next time on Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network, the headquarters of Sports Yesteryear. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com to find out more about this and other sports history podcasts. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. Newspaper circa 1924. But for Marla Delft, assistant editor, everything was about to change. For she was about to discover the awesome attractiveness of Row One brand retro sports paraphernalia items thanks to Orville Mulligan, sports writer. And there it is. Wow, Orville, that's really the bee's knees. Isn't it just? A poster sized replica of the actual 1909 World Series program cover. I can see that. But where did you get it? And where did you get it framed? I ordered it from the Row 1 website, where over 6,000 items of sports memorabilia from the 1880s to the 1990s are available for reproduction, in multiple sizes and in several different materials, with over a dozen styles of frame to choose from for prints like this. Well, I'm sure Mr. Delft would love to put up more of these in the office. But I'm equally as sure they're beyond this newspaper's budget. (laughs) <laughs> Not at all, my dear Marla. See for yourself. Go to sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. Oh my, these are good prices. Oh, and look at this stuff. Oklahoma, Nebraska football. College basketball art. Michael Jordan items. And so Retro it was that Marla Delft discovered the spondiferous magic of row one sports memorabilia arts and prints. You can, too, by visiting sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one. That's R-O-W number one today for access to the full row one catalog of gallery prints and gifts like t-shirts, long sleeve shirts, telephone cases, coffee mugs, blankets, pillows, towels, and even shower curtains. Act today for a 15% discount off all prints with coupon code SHN15 and 20% off all other items with coupon code SHN20 at Check out and keep your dial locked to the Sports History Network for the exciting chronicles of the 1920 sports world in Orville Mulligan, sports writer, coming soon.